uh, usually when we go through a passage, when we uh, go through one of these pieces of scripture, we start at the top and we just kind of go down and take it verse by verse, piece by piece. Today, I want to come at it from a different perspective because I think that's what God wants is us to have a different perspective, a different point of view. And so as we dive through this today, I, I want to look at this from the bottom and I want to go from the bottom up. So if you would, uh, in chapter 3, verse 15, he begins with this. All of us then who are mature, meaning everyone who is a growing Christian, everyone who is mature in Christ, if you are growing in Jesus Christ, and it says, we should take this point of view. And if, if you think differently, then that too God will make clear to you. And so I just want to pray this morning as we dive into this passage that God would help us see things from his point of view from this perspective of maturity. And for those of us who have some growing to do in Jesus Christ, and I, I use the plural, that the royal we is, and like you guys have some growing to do and I don't, because even Paul in this book says, no, 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 I am not there yet. I have not arrived. And I want for all of us to realize we have some maturing to do. We have some growing to do. And part of that begins when we change our perspective, when we change the way we view life and come into alignment with the way that Jesus views it with who God is telling us to be. So if you would, pray with me that God would just begin to change our perspective to his. Because that's what he says. He goes, if you don't agree with scripture, he goes, just keep on pursuing God and he'll make it clear to you too. So let's pray that God would do just that as we dive into his word. God, I simply pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds. God, so many times we come to scriptures that we don't agree with or we don't like. And Lord, I, I simply ask today that you would give us your perspective on the word, that you would show us who we need to be. And Lord, that we would not try to bend or twist or manipulate scripture to make it echo what we want it to say or make it uh, just kind of resonate with our own lives. But Lord, would we bend and twist and, uh, and move our lives to be in alignment with you? God, I pray that today as we just open up your word, you would make it clear. Because, Lord, we know it's your Holy Spirit that makes Scripture clear. It's your Holy Spirit that makes Scripture come alive. It's because of your Holy Spirit and your eternal word that 2,000 years later, reading a book that was written for a church on the other side of the world, this book has been so crazy relevant to us and our situation we're in today. And it's your Holy Spirit that makes these things clear. So, Lord, would your Holy Spirit open up our hearts and our minds. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul begins this passage, and he, and he simply says this, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write you the same thing again and again, because it's a safeguard to you. He goes, I know I sound like I'm repeating myself, but it's worth it, because I'm trying to repeat myself so that you really catch what I'm trying to communicate with you. And he says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Uh, when Paul says, listen, it's no trouble for me to write you the same thing, circle, highlight, or underline in your Bible that word, same thing. And then do me a favor, draw an arrow where it says up to the same thing. And I want you to draw an arrow up to where it says, rejoice in the Lord. Because if there is one note that Paul has been repeating himself on again and again and again, it is this idea, rejoice in the Lord. You see, the book of Philippians, even though it's written from prison, even though it's written to a church with a whole lot of issues, even though it's written in the midst of conflict, even though it's written while Paul is under house arrest, the whole theme of the book is joy. Have you noticed it? If you would, I want to go back and, and just kind of look at all of the joy we've seen in this book. If you have a pen or a highlighter, um, or if you, especially if you have a highlighter of a different color, go back and some, highlight some of these verses where Paul talks about joy. I just want to point out the joy that he's mentioned. Is he says, listen, I'm going to say the same thing to you again and again, and I want you to see this theme of joy that he writes with in this book. And beginning in verse 4, he says this, In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. I'm not praying out of misery because it's like, oh, you guys are so jacked up. He goes, no, I, I just have such joy in you. And he goes, because of your partnership in the gospel. He continues in verse 18. He says, uh, when he's talking about all of the persecution that he's going under, when he's talking about how he's in jail and other pastors are now beginning to steal his flock, when he's talking about he's in jail and people are now trashing his reputation, he responds with this. The important thing is in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. 
He says, when Christ is preached, I have reason to rejoice. It doesn't matter anything else so long as the mission continues. And then he continues, he goes, and I will continue to rejoice because you pray for me. He goes, your prayers bring me joy. Even persecution brings me joy. In verse 25, he says this, I'm convinced of this. When he's talking about, hey, I don't know what my sentence is going to be, whether they're going to keep me in jail, whether they're going to let me go, or whether they're going to behead me. He says, he goes, I continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. He goes, the reason I'm still around is so not only you can progress, not only so you can have this mature attitude, but so that you can have joy. He goes, I want you to have the joy that Christ gave to you. In, verse, in chapter 2, he says, I want you to make my joy complete by being like-minded and one in the Holy Spirit. And verse 2, chapter 17 when he's talking about he's being poured out like a drink offering, a sacrifice and a service. We talked about this uh, last week or two weeks ago. I don't know when we talked about it. And he says, no, but I'm glad and I rejoice even in my sufferings. Even though I'm being poured out and my life is coming to the end. He goes, I'm just rejoicing that I'm doing it with you. And he goes, and you should also rejoice with me. When he talks about sending Epaphroditus, he goes, the whole reason I'm sending him back is so that you can be filled with this joy I have. And now in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, brothers and sisters, have you noticed the theme of the book that I'm trying to write? He goes, it's not a problem for me to lace it throughout the entirety of the book, that even when things aren't going, bad, things aren't going well, even when things are going poorly, he says, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. See, that's the center of our joy. It's not the circumstances we're under. See, it's easy to be in a good mood when circumstances are going well. But the wonderful thing about the fact that God never changes, that God still remains on the throne, is we can rejoice in the Lord. And he goes, I, I want to remind you of it. He goes, you see, that needs to be a safeguard in your life. He goes, because if you take your eyes off of the Lord, then you will never be able to have this joy because we will be so focused on everything happening around us. Because it's why we need to maintain our focus. So rejoice in this if everything else in the world is up in, up in the air. Which, let's be honest, most of the things in our world right now are up in the air. I've had a lot of anxiety. And anxiety gives way to depression. And I know that, that all the things that Scripture tells us to do about do not neglect meeting together, he instructs us to do these things because he knows what happens when we stop meeting together. People stop spurring us on. We lose our joy. And, and there's this anxiety about what's going to happen. And we have friends who can come along and say, no, 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 no. That's what all last week was about, that we need some good friends in the gospel to come alongside and partner with us. And he goes, we need these friends to come along and say, listen, just focus on the Lord. Don't lose sight of what you're doing. And it's why he says, focus on the Lord, because there's a lot up in the air. You have a lot of anxiety. You have a lot of depression. So keep your joy grounded in him. And he goes, and I'll come back and I'll say it again and again, because it'll guard you. And then he says this, watch out for those dogs. Man, Paul really digs into these guys. Paul's getting worked up. He, and he says, they are dogs. They are evildoers. They are mutilators of the flesh. Who is he talking about? A quick thing we wrote down in your Creek Notes is this, just a short history lesson. The big debate that was happening at this time was whether Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament laws with his death and resurrection, or whether the Old Testament laws still applied. You see, when Paul was writing and he says, I know what the other pastors are saying about my reputation while I'm in jail. I know they're taking advantage of this opportunity and what's happening right now. He's referring to this group who came along behind him everywhere he went and everywhere he preached the gospel. This group of Jews would follow along behind him and say, yeah, 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 Jesus died for your sins, but you also need to become a Jew. You see, you're not just saved by grace. You're not just saved by, by God. He goes, you have to work for it. Here are all the laws you have to follow. And among them was circumcision. So as they're going to a Greek audience saying, hey, I'm so glad you came to know Jesus. Did anyone tell you about the membership requirements? And these Greek men and women, I was about to say men and women, but especially the men, are rethinking their commitment to Jesus. And Paul is in prison going, no, you have to watch out for them. They're dogs. They're, they, they want you to work for it, but working for your salvation is rooted in evil. He goes, because it's by grace that we are saved. He goes, they're just mutilators of the flesh. There's nothing that comes from it. And see, what Paul is writing is this. Beware of joy thieves. Beware of people who will come along and steal your joy in the Lord. 
Because they'll come, and Jesus warned us of this, they'll come dressed as wolves in sheep's clothing, and they will try and steal your joy. At the time, it was these, what's called the Judaizers. They, they called themselves the circumcision group. And Paul will actually confront this in the next verse, because he goes on to say this. He goes, it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit, circle, highlight, or underline that, by his spirit, in verse 3, he says, we who boast in Christ, underline that, we boast in Christ, and we who put no confidence in the flesh, circle, highlight, or underline that, because this group who came along behind Paul called themselves the circumcision group. And Paul says, no, 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 they call themselves the circumcision group because they want you to be circumcised. He goes, but we are the circumcision. He goes, what circumcision was all about, and it's weird to talk about circumcision in church and mention it like seven or eight times in a row. It begins to sound weird in your brain. And he says, no, we are the circumcision. He goes, circumcision was a symbol of the covenant that Abraham made with God. It was a symbol of the covenant that Moses made with God. You see, it was, always a, it was a marking to say, listen, I have made a covenant with God that I'm going to be different. And he goes, but it's not about circumcision. I was about to define that, but I'm not going to. And he says, it's not about circumcision. He goes, no, we are the circumcision. He goes, our lives are marked. He goes, you want to know how we are the ones who stand out for God? And he said, mentions three things. We serve God by his spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit in your life is the new mark of the covenant. That's what it is. You know you're a Christian because you have his Holy Spirit. And he goes, you know what else? He goes, we boast in Jesus Christ. We don't boast that we're following the law. We don't boast about how good we are. We boast about how good Jesus is, that he rescued us when we did not deserve it. Because anyone who boasts in their own accomplishments is either lying or deluding themselves. Because it is by grace which we are saved because we can't earn it on our own. And I don't want you to be down on yourself, but I want you to have a realistic perspective of this. And he says, we are, we, goes, we put no confidence in the flesh. And that's not just about circumcision. He goes, we have no confidence in ourselves. He goes, we're broken people. We need the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus in our lives to keep us on track. You see, the big debate that was happening at the time was, did Jesus fulfill the Old Testament laws or do they still apply today? And the key question comes down to this. What was the purpose of the Old Testament? What was the purpose of the Old Testament? Was it a stairway to heaven as if you could build your life on these laws or was everything a signpost to Jesus? You see, this is the first perspective that you need to have if you want to reach Christian maturity. This is the first mind shift that you have to have is every story in Scripture is pointing to Jesus Christ and his salvation. Not that we can ever work for our salvation, not that we can ever do it on our own, but everything was a symbol. Everything was, a, was an illustration to say, listen, Jesus is the way. And Paul just wants them to know, hey, circumcision was the same way. He goes, we are the circumcision because we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. We don't put confidence in the flesh, but we boast about Jesus and what he's done, not on our own accomplishments. And he says that was the whole point of Scripture. We did a whole study about Galatians in this, so I'm just going to move past that now. And he says, continues on in verse 4. He goes, uh, we put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself have reason for such confidence. He says, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew among Hebrews. He goes, in regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. He goes, I never departed from the law. I put so many boundaries around the law that it could not be violated. As far as my zeal, my excitement, uh, just the way I got excited about Jesus, he goes, I persecuted the church. As far as righteousness based upon the law, if I could find righteousness based upon the law, I was faultless. And Paul continues and says, if meaning and purpose could be found outside of Jesus Christ, if anyone could have accomplished this on their own, it was me, I'm the guy. But I wasn't the guy. He goes, if anyone could have, could have earned this, he goes, it would have been me. And he goes, but I couldn't have done it. He says, I worked for it. He goes, if anyone thinks they have reason. You see, Paul was a humble guy, but he did not have a lot of low self-image of himself. We can catch it in this. He's never a guy to sit and moan and say, man, you know, I just didn't have a lot of talents. I didn't have a lot of abilities. I'm not very good at what I do. No. Paul had so much confidence in himself. 
And he says, yeah, I didn't put confidence in my flesh, but in Jesus. You see, Paul's writing to us and he goes, listen, I lived it out. He goes, I tried to live by this law. I've been there. I've chased that. And you know what I found? It's empty. It's hollow. And in the next passage, he'll go on to say, it's rubbish. He goes, everything I worked for in my own self-righteousness, do you want to know where it got me? Nowhere. And Paul is using his life as a cautionary tale to say, I've been there, and let me tell you, trying to pursue your own righteousness will simply steal your joy. Because you have to have joy in the Lord. You have to put confidence in Christ. What matters is this, that we worship in the Spirit, that we rejoice in Jesus, and we do not put confidence in the flesh. He continues in verse 7 and says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What Paul is writing to the people is saying this, Don't let your religion prevent you from knowing God. Don't let your religion prevent you from knowing God. By the way, if you're seeing that blank on your, on your page, on your creek notes, you can put anything in that blank. All answers are valid. Do not let whatever you are pursuing most in this life prevent you from seeking God. For Paul, it was his self-righteousness. What is it for you that you pursue above everything else, thinking, I can do this, I've got it in me, and it actually prevents you from finding God? You see, the ironic thing is this. The more that you chase in this life, the more empty you will find your life being. In John 10, 10, Jesus wrote and he said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. But he gave us a warning. He said, there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he says, there's someone who wants to steal this life from you. And can I tell you one of the things that will steal your life, that will steal your joy? It is pursuing this life above the life that Christ has for you. You see, Jesus Christ came to give you life but we don't want to believe it from somebody else's story. Paul says, listen, I chased all of these things and they wound up empty. I pursued all of these things and it got me nowhere. But we don't like to hear it from somebody else's perspective. Nobody wants to hear a rich person say, do not chase money. It will not satisfy you. It's like, maybe not for you. If you don't feel good about it, give me your money and I will see for myself. We don't want to hear from a successful person, someone who's already achieved success. Don't pursue success. It's empty. It's empty. We're like, well, it seems to be working for you. You are successful. In the same way, Paul is saying, don't chase whatever it is you're chasing. He goes, all of these pursuits will simply leave you empty. He goes, do not chase this life. Do not chase your own righteousness. He goes, I had that. If it was the source of life like I thought it was, it would have brought me life. And Paul says, no. He goes, I consider it now a loss. He goes, all of that time I spent pursuing something other than Jesus. He goes, I can, whatever were gains to me back then, whatever I thought would increase the value of my life, he goes, I don't consider it valuable anymore. He goes, I consider it all loss. In verse 8, what's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. That word garbage or rubbish, whatever you have in your Bible, the, the word in the Greek is skubala, which simply means human excrement. It was what you would fill your chamber pot with and then throw out onto the street. He goes, because in, back in the day, we didn't have working plumbing. We didn't have working plumbing. I've always had working plumbing. Back in the day, they did not have working plumbing. And so what they would do is they would have some kind of pot that they would use or they'd go behind the house. And if they kept it in the house, then they would just kind of throw it out. And that was the word skubala. He goes, whatever I used to pursue, he goes, it's rubbish, it's garbage, it, it's chamber fought refuge, it's excrement. I would have just thrown it, everything away now that I know Christ. And here's the irony. Paul is saying everything in this world that you want to chase is, is like garbage. And here's the irony is that there are so many beautiful and wonderful things that God has given us in this life. There's so many wonderful, beautiful gifts of God that he has given to us. And in Genesis 1, in the creation story, God says, everything I made is good. God doesn't say everything I made. He's like, he makes it and he's like, eh, it's garbage. Like, that's how I act when I make stuff. Like, I make stuff and I'm like, eh, it's not very good. I wad it up and I throw it away. 
Uh, see, that's not how God reacted when he made stuff. He says, no, it is good. It is good. It is good. You see, everything that God has made, all of the wonderful gifts are not garbage, but they are good. And see, Paul is trying to make a contrast. He says, compared to knowing Jesus, all of these other pursuits, all of the other good things in life, he goes, I can do without any of them because I have Jesus. You see, the problem comes when we turn our affections from all of the good things when we turn, sorry, the problem comes when we turn all of our affections to the good things God has given us instead of the good God who gave them. You see, you see why I stumbled on that sentence? The problem comes when we turn our affections from to all of the good things God has given us instead of turning our affection to the good God who gave them. If you pursue the things of God, then you'll never find satisfaction. We wrote it this way in your Creek Notes. Pursue God over his gifts. Pursue God over his gifts. And this can be hard for us because there are things which are good which God will ask you to give up. And he says, you have to give this up. Why? Because it's become an idol for you. Can I tell you, Paul's seeking his own righteousness became an idol for him. But nobody would say, at least nobody here on staff would say, that obedience to the scripture is a bad thing. Like, we look at it and say, no, 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 we're supposed to obey. We're supposed to follow God. Like, this word is a lamp unto our feet. We're, that's the reason we open up the word, word of God every day. But Paul says, listen, but it became an idol to me. It became something that I pursued my own self-righteousness with, and I turned this good thing into a God thing, a little g. It became my idol, and I pursued it. And we have to pursue God over his gifts. And you see, so many times we want God to help us get the things in this life that we believe will fulfill us. If you believe you will be fulfilled by a job, we say, God, give me a, a job. Give me a position that will be fulfilling to me. If you're single and you think marriage will fulfill you, you say, God, give me a wife or a husband who will fulfill me. And we want to use God to get all of these things that we think will fulfill us. But nothing will be able to fulfill you besides God. Can I tell you, guys, if, you, if you're looking to your spouse to fulfill you, you will always be disappointed in your marriage because your spouse cannot fulfill you in the way that God is intended to. Now, let me tell you, your spouse is a good gift from God. You need to recognize them for everything they are, for this, this beautiful and wonderful gift from the Lord our God. But do not put them on an idol, on a pedestal. Because it will leave you wanting. Guys, God created your work because he has work for us to do. And work is actually a gift from God. And, and I know a lot of us are like, I don't consider my work a good thing. Or a gift from God. But God created work before the fall. He created man and he says now he sent him to work the garden. You see, there's a, a point to which your work should fulfill you. And you feel you're cooperating with God in what you're doing. But if you seek this fulfillment in your work and you become this addicted to, to be, you become a workaholic in it because of the joy it gives you, it becomes that idol. And we can place the good things God has given us over the good God who gave them. And God says, no, 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 I created all those things for you, but they were never intended to be a replacement for me. And see, we have to be able to pursue God above all these things. That's why he wrote to us in Matthew. He said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these other things will be added. What he meant by that was this, if you seek them without me, they will not add anything to your life. It's why Paul says, I consider all things a loss because they did not add anything to my life because I pursued them above God who was pursuing me. And when you lose everything to Jesus, which is what Paul said, I've lost all things to pursue Christ. And the beautiful irony is this, when you lose all things to Jesus Christ, you can actually begin to enjoy all things because you take them for what they're supposed to be, not the idol for which we make them. Does that make sense? Oh, good. You see, when you, when you lose everything to Jesus, you can enjoy it for the good gift it was. I don't know how to explain this, but when, when my life with Jesus is properly aligned, when I'm pursuing him above all other things, food just tastes better. I don't know why. You'd think if I was pursuing food above all things that... that that then it would taste better. And I'm just seeking that out. 
But the irony is God says, no, 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 seek first me, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and then these things will be added. And Paul says, listen, you have to have this mentality, this perspective that says, knowing Jesus is worth the loss of everything else. And then you can take everything else and enjoy it for what it was supposed to be because it's no longer an idol. And Paul says, I consider everything a loss that I may gain Christ. He goes, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. We're in verse 9, by the way. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Circle, highlight, or underline this. Don't miss that. It says, righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. There is no self-righteousness because righteousness means right standing with God and we cannot achieve that on our own. It comes only from God and then only when we put our faith in him. We have to catch that. He goes, I want to know Christ. Circle, highlight, or underline that word, know Christ. He goes, yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection. How many of you guys would say, I want to know the power of the resurrection? Let me tell you, death is a reality. It's a hard reality. I've seen so many friends commenting on so many people who they're losing. And and it gets hard when you lose grandparents and then lose parents and then lose spouses. And death takes you. And you begin to fear for the loss that you will have. And there's a power in the resurrection. And we say, no, no, no. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to be resurrected. I want to be reunited with those people. But Paul doesn't end there. I would love for Paul to have put a period after, I want to know the power of the resurrection. So we all could have said, amen. And instead he says this, I want to participate in his sufferings. How many of you are like, oh. You see, we draw the line somewhere. And he goes, no, in order to understand the resurrection, he goes, I want to know Jesus so much that I understand his sufferings. He goes, because when I understand his sufferings, he goes, I want to become like him in his death. I don't want that. Like there's, when Jesus says, take up your cross, I love the fact that that's a metaphor. I hope. Unless you're Peter or one of the other disciples who all lost their lives for Jesus. And he goes, no, 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 no. I want to understand the power of his sufferings. I want to understand him like his death because unless we understand his death, we cannot somehow obtain resurrection from the dead. You see, righteousness comes from God. You see, we have that same righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul goes on to say. He says, we have righteousness that comes from God. That's the amount of righteousness that Jesus Christ comes. It's not from our own. And Paul says, listen, I want to know him. Circle, highlight, or underline him. I want to know about his resurrection, his suffering, his death. Paul is at this point obsessed with Jesus. And he's not talking about his own self-righteousness anymore. He says, I have done all these things and none of it counts. And he goes, now I just want to pursue Jesus above all other things. And friends, I want you to know, we also suffer like Christ before we are dragged into glory with him. I just want you to know that about life, and that's why Paul says we need to be able to pursue Christ. And I'm envious of Paul, because I think, oh, Paul has such a better relationship with Jesus than I do. I'm like, because I want to know in his resurrection, but I don't want to share in his sufferings. I don't want to pursue in his death. I'm not that in love with Jesus. And if that's the goal, I'm like, I, I'm not there And then I feel better because in verse 12, Paul says, me neither. Paul says, I have not obtained, already obtained all this. I haven't arrived at my goal, but I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. We wrote it this way in your creek notes. As long as I'm alive, I have not arrived. As long as I'm alive, I have not arrived. Because we can read scripture sometime and just see, oh man, that's such a high goal. Like, I'm just not in love with Jesus that much. And we all leave here feeling a little bit guilty or a little bit worse about our walk with God because we're not there. And Paul's like, whoa, 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 I'm not there either. He goes, not that I've obtained all this. I'm not there either. He goes, but that's where I want to be when I grow up. And I love how honest Paul is because Paul will write to us throughout scripture very openly and honestly about his own struggles. 
And, and I much more love, the, I, I much more love, I love a lot more, I'm not sure how to phrase that, the passages where Paul is saying, listen, the things I do is what I don't want to do, and what I do want to do is not what I do. And Paul's just talking about there's this war within me. Because I'm like, oh, if Paul's wrestling, then I don't feel so bad. Paul's like, this is where I want to be, but I'm not arrived yet. And he goes, I don't want you to feel bad about your relationship with Christ, but where are you heading with it? Are you growing? Because the mature perspective needs to look and say, hey, I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. Like, that's my goal. That's where I'm heading. You see, a mature perspective says, this is where I'm growing in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm not there yet, but can I tell you how much further I am than where I was? He goes, I haven't arrived, but I press on. He goes, I'm still moving forward to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So I had a hard time understanding this. I'm pressing forward to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So why did Christ take hold of me? What was Christ trying to offer me? When he grabbed me, what was he trying to give me? And we already talked about in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Now, sometimes we misunderstand that, that verse. We think abundant life means better life. But the word abundant just means more. He says, I've come that you have, may have more life. And with that life, it doesn't just mean oh, all the more of the good stuff. Because he says, I want to know in Christ's suffering. So a lot of times having this abundant life means more of the sufferings in this life too. But Christ says, I have come to give you the life that you're supposed to have. And so if Christ took hold of me to give me this abundant life, then I want to take hold of the life that Christ has promised me. And I began to think, okay, how do I explain this? How do I understand what he means when he says, I, I press on to take hold of that which Christ has taken hold of me? And, and so I'm like, what does it mean for Christ to take hold of me so that I can take hold of the life he has for me? And, and this week it occurred to me as I was tending to our 10-month-old baby, like so many of you guys, uh, my wife and I are foster parents. And so we have kids regularly coming out. We've adopted two daughters in our life, and now we have a 10-month-old baby girl in our life. Uh, she came to us about a week ago, and she is the, the sweetest, happiest little butterball I've ever seen in my life. And, and she loves food. And she's always talking and babbling and making the cutest noises until she's hungry. And when she is hungry, and I, I've had a lot of kids and been around a lot of babies, I've never seen a baby do this before, though. When she gets hungry, she does not cry. She does not make a noise. She screeches like a pterodactyl. I don't know another way to compare the noise that she makes. But she goes from bubbling and being happy to this, like, Ka -ka! like, it's terrifying, and I can't accurately imitate it. I want to bring her up here and record this, and, and, but it's just this terrifying noise. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. And so you always know when she's hungry. It's different from when she needs a diaper change or she wants to be held. The hungry noise is very distinctive. And so I will reach down and I will take hold of her. And then we'll go and she'll see that bottle for which I'm bringing to her. And she begins to struggle out of my arms, reaching for that bottle because she wants it. And the pterodactyl noises get louder. It's like, ah! And she just makes these terrible screeching sounds. And, and so she can take hold of this bottle, which is the life that she wants. And in the same way, it occurred to me as I was going through this with her, just taking hold of her so she could see the bottle. And she just reaches out for it. She's so eager for it. And she's just wanting to take hold of that for which I have taken hold of her. In the same way, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And Jesus reaches down and picks us up. And he goes, now you can take hold of the life. And my question for you is this. Are you reaching out just so eagerly to grab the life that Jesus wants for you? Because my four-year-old never liked to hold her own bottle. When she was a baby, she never reached out. She never tried to take hold of it. Even to this day at four, she likes to be fed. She'll crawl up into my lap and bring me her plate. And she goes, you can feed me the rest of this meal. Like, that's not, like, she verbalizes that. She has those level of words. And you see... Which illustration are you more like? When it comes to the life that God has had for you, are you reaching out to grab it and you just can't not wait to take hold of it? And Paul says, I, I reach out to take hold of that which God has taken hold of me for. This, yesterday when I was uh, 
uh, my 12 year old Zach is trying out for soccer practice and I dropped him off at the fields so that he can sweat in the th thousand degree weather with the mosquitoes. And I don't stay out there. Instead, I'm actually looking for a bike for him right now because uh, he's outgrown his old bike. And at the same time, bikes the toilet paper. You cannot find them. Like when we started social distancing and we started like not going into work, everybody's like, let's get healthy. And they all went and bought up all the bikes. And there are no bikes in America right now. Or, they, or there are, but they're all in your garage. And so I cannot find a bike for him that he needs to grow into. And if you have a 24-inch, you know, kid's bike, let me know. Um, and so, so I began to call around and I went to Walmart while he was at practice. And of course, they don't have bikes. They had a few broken ones, a few toddler ones, a few tricycles. Uh, that won't work for him. And so I, it occurred to me, and I began to call pawn shops. And I thought, maybe I can find a bike somewhere else. Actually, first I called the specialty bike shops, and they're like, yeah, we have the bike. And I'm like, oh, perfect. And they said, it's going to be $543. And I said, I want to support the local economy, but the local economy will need to support me a whole lot more before I can support you back, because I can't. That is not the bike I'm buying for my child. And so I started calling pawn shops, and one of them finally answered and said, we have a bike for $25. And I'm like, now you're talking. And I said, hold that bike. Put it on hold for me. And I'm going to get my son, and we're going to come and look at the bike. I want to make sure it fits him. And so I figured this will be great. I'm going to pick him up after soccer. We're going to go, and we're going to see the bikes and make sure everything works. And I go to this pawn shop to take a look at this bike before I get there. I said, hey, I called ahead. Y'all had a bike. And they said, oh, yeah, it's gone. Someone came in and bought it. I said, but I put it on hold. And they said, yes, but someone else came and took a hold of it. You see, I want to let you know, your life that Christ has for you is on hold until you reach out and take a hold of it. And so Paul says, I press forward in the gospel. I am moving forward in Christ. This has to be the perspective of maturity. And I'm going to press forward to take a hold of the life that Christ came to give me. But your life will continually be on hold until you reach out and take a hold of it. And I got robbed from the bike I was supposed to have because someone else took a hold of it. And Christ warns us, not just that he's come to give us life and give it more abundantly. Before that, he says, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There is someone who wants to steal the life that Christ has for you. There is someone who wants to steal the joy that Christ has for you. And he's not going to do it very obviously. The way he's going to do it is by distracting you with other things, with other pursuits that are not the pursuit of God. And he'll say, pursue your own righteousness, pursue your satisfaction, pursue your own way, pursue, pursue, pursue. And Paul writes, he goes, listen, I've pursued those things and can I tell you they're dead ends, they're hollow and they're empty. I hope you believe it from me. And he says, so I press forward to take a hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. And he writes in verse 13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. Circle, highlight, or underline your Bible in verse 13, I forget what is behind and I strain towards what is ahead. Two things we need on our path to maturity. Number one, You've got to forget the past. What is holding you back from your pursuit with Christ? Is it a former pursuit that you just can't let go of? Is it guilt? Have you been there in church before where we're here worshiping and you just kind of get caught up in the spirit and we're singing and you're like, oh, and all of a sudden in your mind, you hear this voice and it's not yours and it's not God's. And Satan goes, really, you're going to raise your hand? Don't you know what you've done with those hands? Suddenly my hand goes back in my pocket. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And he goes, really, you're going to praise him with those lips? Don't you know the things you've said with those lips? Yeah, I know that too. And Satan comes and he says, listen, you have done all of those things. Who are you to think you can press forward into the life that God has had for you? You have destroyed this life. And he whispers all of these things to me. And Paul reminds us, don't let him do that. You need to forget what is behind. And he goes, you need to strain towards what is ahead. So meaning this fight for this active movement forward. Some of you have never pulled a spiritual muscle before because you have never strained 
to get closer to Christ. Like we talk a lot about exercise and diet and all doing all these things. Spiritually speaking, how are you straining yourself? How are you moving forward in Christ? Where are you pushing it to the limit? Paul goes, that's how I move forward into maturity. He goes, I strain towards what's ahead. I'm pressing there. I'm moving as fast as I can. And he goes, I press on towards the goal to win for that which Jesus has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He goes, I keep on moving. And it's this picture of being at the end of a race. Uh, for those of you, I, I used to run before. And I would get to these 5Ks, and they were agonizing. I tried to build up to a 5K, but I wouldn't do it because, you know, I was lazy. And so I'd come, they would come to the race, and I figured, oh, I'll just get up and run the 5K. And I wouldn't do it very well, and I'd kind of press because, once again, I had not strained a muscle. I had not pressed forward. And Paul goes, I want you to have this perspective of the end of the race. Because for some reason, when I get to the end of the race, there will be that person along the end, that's the, the cheerleader, and they're like, you're almost there, it's right ahead, and they're just cheering you on. And you don't know this person, but you're so happy they're there, because they just told you, you can keep going, you're almost there. You don't have to keep running, like, just, just get there, and you can be done with the suffering, and I'm like, oh, and so I press forward. And it's when you see this finish line, all of a sudden, this burst of energy just comes, and I'm just able to move forward and run faster than I have for the last three miles, and I find this energy that came out of nowhere. Have you been there? And Paul says, that's what it looks like to press forward in Christ. He goes, to strain towards what's ahead. You see the end of the race, and you push it. And he says, all of us then, who are mature, should take this view on things. This is what it looks like to find spiritual maturity, is to pursue Christ above all else. And he says, and if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. He goes, if you don't agree with these things, he goes, pursue God, you'll come on board. He goes, if you don't like what scripture has to say, just keep on pursuing him, he'll make it clear to you too. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. This is another question I had just as I was ending this, and, I, and we'll wrap up as we come back to the beginning. He says, live up to what you've already obtained. He says, you've already obtained grace. You've already obtained salvation. Now, live up to that which you've already obtained. And the question occurred to me, if I've already obtained it, then why do I have to strive for it? If I've already obtained it, if it's already mine, then why do I have to take hold of it? If I've already obtained it, it's already mine, then why do I have to press forward into it? If I've got God's grace, then why do I need to work so hard to like stay in his grace? And it's this picture of Christ taking hold of us so that we can take hold of the life which is ahead of us. It's this collaboration with him. It's not that God comes in and does all the work. It's not that we do the work. Because let me tell you, that 10-month-old baby would never be able to get that bottle on her own in a million years. I do my part and scoop her up. And she does what is possible by reaching out and grabbing it. And it says, take hold, live up to what you've already obtained so if I've already obtained it, why do I have to continue striving for it? You see, you won't realize what you've already been given until you want it with all of your being. God says, you will find me when you pursue me with all of your heart. But with this whole half-hearted thing, you're never going to get it. He goes, it's why you have to strain to achieve what you've already obtained because you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And God says, you're not even finding me. I came to find you. But your part is to respond. And reach out and seize the life which Christ has for you. And say, God, I want everything that you have for me. And you won't have it until you seek it with your whole heart. Until you want it so much that everything else seems like rubbish. And you say, but the pursuit of Christ is worth giving up everything else in life. Jesus told it this way. He says, there was once a pearl diver. And there was a pearl of such unfathomable value that the pearl divers sold everything they have to go get it. 
and reached down and scooped and grabbed a hold of it. He said, it's like a man who finds out about a treasure buried in a field. It's like you find gold in them, they're hills. So what do you do? You sell everything you have and go buy that field. Jesus says, listen, you have to pursue me like that. You have to be willing to get past all of the other things in this life, all of the other temptations, all of the other pursuits in your life, and pursue one thing above all, and that is Christ. And he goes, and when you do, you will find that you have more value. You'll find that you have more in me than you ever had without me. But you have to be willing to lose everything, to gain everything, and pursue Jesus. So my question for you today is this. How's your pursuit? Because the key to spiritual maturity is never taking your eyes off Christ and never stop pursuing him. And for some of you, I want to to let you know because some of you have not entered into this relationship with Jesus Christ yet. You've heard about him and you may be pursuing self-righteousness. You may be chasing Jesus and, Jesus and something else. And Jesus goes, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Give up these other things, forsake these other pursuits because they will leave you empty and just chase me. And that's what we're called to do. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to let you know that today you can choose to follow him and say, God, I'm done chasing all these other things in the life. I want the life that you have for me. I want you instead. And it's a simple prayer, which we'll pray with you in just a second. For those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I want to let you know the offer is the same thing for you today. Because we think, oh, good, I have Jesus. And then we take our eyes off the prize and we continue to pursue other things. And even Paul says, I I haven't mastered this yet. I haven't obtained it. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to press forward. And so many of us who know Jesus Christ say, all right, this is my opportunity to recommit and say I'm all in. And this is the prayer I want you to pray. Father God, thank you so much for giving your life for me. Father God, thank you so much for pursuing me. Thank you so much for seeking me out and loving me to the point of death. Jesus, I want to find you, so I need to pursue you with my whole heart. But Lord, I'm being really half-hearted with it because I'm pursuing all these other things at the same time. So enhance my focus. Help me pursue you above all else. Because I know I can't obtain it on my own, but Lord, you've given it to me, and yet I need to strive for it. So help me chase this with everything I have that I may find you. Lord, help us want to know you better, to know the power of your resurrection, to know your sufferings, to know you in death and find life. Lord, it can feel like death to give up some of the things that we'll have to lose. But we know in pursuing you, we will find life and life abundantly. So God, I just want to take hold of that for which you've taken hold of me. Jesus, I give you my life. Give me the life I'm supposed to have in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.